So we're back. January 2018, CSEC Biology. And we are now looking at question four. And it opens with a look at the reflex arc. And we're being asked to describe the response of an individual as that person's skin comes into contact with a hot surface suddenly. Right, and it's in six parts, six parts, six six marks. So I know my answer is a little short, so I'll expand on it a little bit. So the first thing is that the thermoreceptor in the skin detects a dangerously high temperature signal sent to a neuron. So in this case, I would add a sensory neuron. Neuron to the spinal cord. All right. There it is sent from sensory neuron to relay neuron. All right. And then from the really neuron, it's sent immediately to a motor neuron that would then connect to the muscle that pulls the body part away from the hot surface. Right, so we have a question saying that the skin plays a role in maintaining constant body temperature. And we're being asked to explain the skin's role in reduction of internal body temperature. So that means we're talking about what happens if the temperature is too high. So your body's going to work with your skin to bring that temperature back down. And we have to suggest why internal body temperature should be kept constant. So the skin helps to reduce by responding in the following manner. We have sweating, right? We release sweat onto the surface. The sweat then uses heat to evaporate. And then we have the capillaries that are close to the skin surface. They become dilated. Remember, they become wider, right? They get a larger, so that allows a larger volume of blood to travel through it in a given time. And remember, that blood is going to be bringing heat from inside of the body out to the surface. So once they become dilated, it's easier for that heat and heat energy to be dissipated, to dissipate away from the body, right? And that will be about two marks each. And then for the fifth mark, you explain why or suggest why internal body temperature should be kept constant. Your metabolism depends on temperature-sensitive enzymes. And if the, and if the temperature is too high, it's way above optimum, those enzymes very quickly lose their function. Right, so that's why you need to keep that temperature low because that can literally lead to your death. Right, it's a lethal situation if your temperature is too high. And then we have part C. So, scientists are predicting global temperatures will continue to rise over the next decade. And we are asked to state two factors that have contributed to rising global temperatures and negative effects of rising global temperatures. So there's a lot to talk about here. Lots and lots to talk about. See, plenty. So first thing we have factors that contribute to rising global temperatures. We have our industries that release high quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this would be via combustion of fossil fuels. All right. And then we have our internal combustion engine vehicles, basically our gas vehicles 
that release also release high quantities of CO2 into the atmosphere with their car exhaust. All right. And then we have ways in which global temperatures affect biodiversity. There are many. This list is not exhaustive. Trust me, I looked. <laughs> And um, you can write any two of these or any other appropriate answer you may have come across in your own notes, etc. Um, as I said, as I keep stating, this ebook that I am doing this video from is available for free. And if you are watching this before 2023 exams, you just need to click on the link to pre-order it and it will be sent to you as soon as it's ready. And it will be sent to you long before the exam, all right? So these are the many possible answers. You select two. And then we go to 2018 question five. Three types of diseases. And you have to state an example of each. So we have several types of disease. We have from the... Infectious, physiological, mental, lifestyle, genetic, deficiency, right? All these types. And just any three of those and give an example. So you have those and examples provided as well. And they're saying immunity might be naturally or artificially acquired. And they're asking us for differences between the natural and artificial and, and steps, any three steps, okay, by which artificial immunity is acquired. All right. So differences. Well, we have um, natural is developed after exposure to the disease pathogen or toxin. And artificial active immunity develops after exposure to a weakened version of the pathogen and or its products. So big difference in terms of when and how you get exposed and how that active immunity is um, triggered. Then we have natural passive immunity. That depends on you passing on antibodies from mother to child, either in the womb or via breast milk. Artificial is when you're transferring antibodies to any persons without any mother-child connection. So, for example, if you were not vaccinated against tet tetanus and you get a cut um, with some rust in it, etc., you would not be then given the tetanus vaccine. You would be given um, tetanus antitoxin which is essentially an antibody against the toxin um, produced by the tetanus pathogen. Then a big, another big difference between the two is that overall, I should say, is that natural immunity is more adaptable than artificial. Right? For example, where we give the example of the flu virus, every time it mutates, you have to go make a new vaccine against it. However, the natural immune system will naturally adjust to the new virus and develop new antibodies on its own. The disadvantage, of course, is that if it's a very powerful flu virus, it may make you very, very sick before your natural system has time to develop these new antibodies. So those are your differences. Now let's look at mechanism. So I gave the entire mechanism from start to finish. And you you can, as I said, you can describe any three steps, right? So first you're exposed to a weakened form of the pathogen with proteins. The phagocytes will display those antigens from those pathogens to the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes will produce complementary antibodies to the antigen start to multiply, they produce large numbers of antibodies against the pathogen as a primary immune response. And once that immune response is complete, you're going to be, there are going to be some cells that are left behind 
that will carry that information called memory cells. And those memory cells, once triggered by a future exposure to the same pathogen, will trigger a far more intense and um, speedy response called the secondary immune response to the pathogen. And it's usually so rapid and so intense that you don't even know you got exposed because it gets rid of the pathogen immediately before you can get any symptoms. Yeah. So that's why sometimes people say vaccines work. Vaccines suffer from the problem of working too well. They work so well that people think the disease disappeared when it's, no, the disease didn't disappear. It's just the vaccine works so well that your body handles the pathogen before you even notice you got it. Yeah? So it's not that it's gone. It's there, but your body just dealt with it before you could get a sniffle. Yeah? Right, so to end this, um, question six, looking at some sexual reproduction. And, <clears throat> and they're telling us, okay, we, we're looking movement of male gummies. All right. Yes, that is true when you think about it. For both plants and animals, the onus is on the male gamete to move towards the female gamete in order to fertilize it. Yeah. And we're being, firstly, we're being asked to list events in meiosis that can produce variation. So we give the two main um the two main occasions we have prophase one when the homologous pairs they join each other and they exchange pieces with each other and then the other events when you have random assortment of the homologous pairs on the spindle fibers right you have your maternal and paternal chromosome so the chromosome in the pair that originally came from your mother versus the one that originally came from your father, they don't always have to line up on the same side. It's not one side or one side all maternal, one side all paternal, right? You could have a mix up. You could have maternal, maternal, then some paternal, et cetera, et cetera, right? So because they are randomly arranged on the spindle fibers, that produces another level of variation. Because in the gametes, you're going to get a different combination of maternal and paternal chromosomes, right? <clears throat> and those are the two ways you get some variation. Describe the process by which the male gamete reaches the female gamete in a flower. So the male gamete is carried in the pollen grain, and that pollen lands on the stigma of the flower. And once it's compatible, it goes a pollen tube and down the style, gets into the micropyle, and then the male gamete nucleus travels down the pollen tube into the ovule and fertilizes it. Yeah, just write like that, and fertilizes it. Okay, you can mention that it gets there either via a wind or animal I shouldn't say vectors via animals. Why are we no animals? So whether it's an insect, a butterfly, um, a bird, right, it will carry the pollen to the other flower, or just good old fashioned wind blowing and taking the pollen grain with it. Right? So that's how it ends up on the stigma of the flower. And last part of Last part of question six, we have some genetics to play around with. So we have um, a hemophiliac 
hemophiliac child, both of that child's parents have the normal blood clotting traits. So when you look at their phenotype, they're both normal. They Their blood clots normally. So the question will be, well, how come they end up with a child that's hemophilia? Well, it means that if both parents are normal, this means that the mother is a carrier because hemophilia is a sex-linked disease, meaning it's carried only on the x-axis. Sorry, <laughs> x-axis, Lord. It carried on the X chromosome, Keisha. Right, chromosome. Right? So if daddy is normal, it means that his X chromosome is normal because he has one X chromosome. If the child ends up with hemophilia, though, that means that that um, chromosome with the disease-causing allele is carried by the mother. Because it's recessive, so she can have the normal allele and the disease-causing allele in her genotype. Because remember, mommy has two X's. And she will, her phenotype will show up as normal. But she's still carrying that disease allele with her. And that can then be carried, um, inherited by the child. So as we can see here, if both parents are normal, this means that the mother is a carrier for the disease-causing allele. And we indicate that hemophilia is a sex-linked condition, carried only on the X chromosome. Therefore, the father could not be a carrier. <clears throat> and of course, that is normal, so he has the normal allele. So you show your diagram symbol. Parent genotype, gametes, and you put that square and you indicate the child with hemophilia. Okay. Now, usually I would say if, the, if you're being asked to just use a genetic diagram to do a complete one. So what do I say here? I did a shortcut, but I still strongly suggest you do the entire thing. So in this case, you would probably would write offspring genotype. So you would include your offspring genotypic ratio here. Right, and your offspring phenotypic ratio. Right, so two normal, one carrier, one hemophiliac, and that would be your complete genetic diagram. And that's it for 2018, January 2018, questions four to six. So look out for 2019, 2020, 2021 in the coming days. So see you then.